And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of your grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Now, God, allow the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart to be found acceptable in thy sight. Speak, O Lord, to the end that your people are edified and you are glorified. May we continue to be transformed by your presence and by your power. It's in the master's name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. For our time today, I want to talk from this subject that the Lord dropped in my spirit, tension in the Christmas family. We know that there are really two Christmas stories, those of you who come to Bible study. One in Matthew's Gospel and the other in Luke's Gospel. Matthew tells us about the birth of Jesus from Joseph's perspective, and Luke gives us the story from Mary's perspective. In the other Gospels, John and Mark do not discuss the birth of Jesus at all. John simply opens, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was anything made that is made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And the Word became flesh dwelt among us, and we beheld its glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Mark opens with the baptism of Jesus, and when Jesus is baptized is where we have the introduction for the first time in Scripture of the Trinity. God speaks and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus shoulder in the form of a dove, and of course we have the presence of Jesus. Um, for the purpose of this preachment, as we approach Christmas, which is moving and coming all too rapidly, I want to speak from Matthew's narrative. When we look at the commercials on TV depicting families coming together in unity and eating around the Christmas table, that's beautifully decorated, adorned with wonderful food like turkey, yams, ham, roast pork, fish, sweet potatoes, pies, cakes, curry goat, oxtails, all kinds of pastries and specialties. Then there's the beautiful decorated Christmas tree beautiful gifts wrapped under the tree, and all appears to be well and in order. However, if you, like many of us, you have some tension, some unrest, some uncomfortable ability in your family, especially during the holiday seasons. If this is your testimony as it is mine, you need to know that you are not alone. As a matter of fact, you're in good company. Jesus himself was born into a family with controversy, stress, and even a scandalous situation. As a matter of fact, the issue regarding the scandal is presented to us in Matthew's historical genealogy. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. If Joseph had been the biological father, it would have been Jacob begot Joseph and Joseph begot Jesus. But inasmuch as he wasn't, 
we're introduced to a scandalous situation in the genealogy account. And when Mary tells Joseph that she is pregnant by the Holy Ghost, Joseph must have been livid, upset, and angry. The Bible says that Joseph, being a just man, decided to put her away privately. The fact that Joseph is a righteous man means that he legally and spiritually had to ask for a divorce. The law itself did not allow him to forgive and to forget. Now, I don't know about you, but I thank God for Jesus, the babe of Bethlehem, because the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus the Christ. The Bible declares that what the law could not do and that it was weak in the flesh, <coughs> God did through sending his son, Jesus, to Christ. You need to understand, and we were having a conversation recently with some people about this, that during these times when you were engaged, the woman remained in her father's house until they were married. And at that time, the couple came together to consummate the marriage. I know it's going to get quiet. But we're so far outside of what the Bible teaches. Because now, before they get married, they live together. And it seems to be all right. But this was not always the case. Grown folk did not allow children to shack up in their house where they pay the rent. Something is wrong when the church becomes afraid to preach the whole counsel of God. In my case, I just moved out. <laughs> because some stuff was not going to happen on 1284 President Street. But just for the record, it didn't happen at 11 Argyle Road either, where I paid the rent. When we came together under the same roof, we were married at the tender age of 19. Didn't know exactly what I was doing. No wonder my father almost lost his mind. Um, that, that, I gave you that for free. That, that's not part of my notes. I'm sure Joseph's friends advised them that he had been played. The consequences of this kind of behavior meant that the woman, according to the law, should be stoned. You remember when the men found the woman who had been caught in adultery? They said, Jesus, we caught this woman in the very act. And you know what the law says. What always intrigued me about that account is that if they found the woman in the very act, what happened to the brother? Thank God for Jesus even then. The Bible says that Jesus stooped down and wrote something on the ground. We don't know exactly what he wrote, but when he looked up, all of those brothers were gone. And Jesus asked the woman, where are those who accused you? She said, I don't know. Old folks said that Jesus wrote the sins that all of them had committed. Jesus simply said to her, go and sin no more. What do you do when there is tension in the family? What do you do when you are the one that you love is accused of a scandalous situation? What do you do when public opinion has turned against you, as I'm sure it did against both Mary and Joseph? And what do you do when you know that everybody is talking about you? You know when folk are whispering, because you can hear the tension above the whisper. What do you do? I want to suggest a couple of things. One, you pray. 
Because God still answers prayer. Secondly, you must be contemplative. You must take time to think. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't make a decision when you're angry. And you must think before you act. Here it is, verse 20. <clears throat> but while he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto yourself Mary for your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and addresses Joseph as son of David, yet Joseph is not the biological father. Jesus must come through the divinic line, and early in the genealogy, as I said, Joseph is referred to as the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. But I want to suggest that in spite of what the law says, in spite of what people say, that in this account of the birth of Jesus, I have proof, because I've done um, Sister Rock, and Sister Carrie, I've done an exegetical, exegetical study. I've looked deeply into the text because I wanted to see if there was some new water, fresh water in an old well. And I come to tell you this morning that I don't care what the law says. I don't care what people say. If God is on your side, God can turn any situation around no matter what the law says because God can do exceedingly abundantly above whatever you can ask or think. Here it is in verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. It's at this context that God places Joseph as the father of Jesus and puts him in the divinic line to make him a part of the royal family. Because you need to understand that it is the father that names the child. And when God instructs Joseph that he shall call the child Jesus and gives Joseph the authority to name Jesus, that causes Joseph to adopt Jesus as his own child that makes him Jesus' earthly father and places him in the divinic line and into the royal family of God and erases all of the scandalous situation because whatever you're going through, God can turn it around. Here it is. And we too, that's what the choir just sang, we have been adopted into the royal family because of Jesus, who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because in the very beginning, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Sin had tore us apart. There was a breach and there was no communication between God and humankind. And there was no word from the Lord for 400 years. But there was a counselor in the heavenly realm. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And Jesus spoke up and said, make me a body and I'll go down and redeem men from their sins so that he that knew no sin became sin for us and adopted us into the royal family so that we could communicate with God 
That's why when we pray, we end all of our prayers in the name of Jesus because he stands as the advocate for us between man and God and pleads our case to the master. I give him praise, honor, and glory. I'm almost done. Uh, Paul, who was a biblical scholar, put it this way in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace be to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. According, he has chosen us in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, because of the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And so when God sends Jesus to become a sacrifice, we become also adopted into the royal family. Paul continues to write, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. And all things become new. And that's why in this same text, it says that the scripture must be fulfilled. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, which is the Hebrew word for God with us. That's what Christmas is about. Christmas is about the fact that God through Jesus Christ is with us. For you have not received, Romans chapter 8, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Finally, in spite of the tension, and the confusion that may come in our lives, in our families, God will keep his word. Amen. How many of you know that? God will keep his word. I was so deep in studying this, I said, well, where is it in the Bible? I found it. Numbers, write this down, chapter 23, Verses 19 to 20. Here it is. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I receive commandments to bless, and he is blessed, and I cannot reverse it. In other words, God does not lie. God does not sin that he needs to repent. And whatever God says, he does what he says. And he says what he does. When God speaks, something happens. When we speak, we just talking. But when God speaks, stuff happens. And God said, let there be light. And it was so. And God said, let the light and the darkness be separated and let the light be called day and the darkness be called night. And it was so. Whenever God says something, it's got to happen. Now are ye the sons and daughters of God and it does not yet appear what it shall be. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him. I'm so glad that I serve a God and that when God says it, that God will perform it, that God will keep his word. I'm a testimony that God is good. So here it is, as I come to closure. But while he thought on these things, every now and then you gotta think about it. 
and let God work it out. An angel appeared unto him. And whenever God shows up, you always hear him say, fear not. Resurrection morning, when God showed up, he said, fear not. Wherever God is, he cancels out fear. If you're going to be fearful, then don't pray. If you pray, you don't need to be fearful. Don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife. Don't worry about what folk are saying. If God has called you to do something, do what God says. God will work it out in spite of what people say. When the favor of God is on you, here's Mary, a peasant child. Here's Joseph, not from an aristocratic family, but God lifted them up because they remained in the will of God. Thou shalt call his son, his name, Jesus. All this was done that it might be fulfilled of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And they did not know each other until she brought forth her firstborn child and called his name Jesus. Isaiah, thousands of years before, prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us, Handel wrote about this in the Messiah, a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And since I met Jesus, there's a whole lot of other names I know him by. I know him as the Prince of Peace. I know him as the Eternal Rock of Ages. I know him as the King of Glory, as the Mighty God, as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords, as the Lord of Hosts, as the Lily of the Valley, as the Bright and Morning Star. I know him as a healer. I know him as a deliverer, provider, creator, day star, cornerstone. I am that I am, the head of the church, the righteous judge, the shield, the merciful God, the faithful God, the Jehovah Rafi, the Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. I know him as defender, redeemer, comforter, trinity, teacher, hope of glory, lion of Judah, fruit of Jesse, light of the world, proclaimer, God all by himself. I know him as the way, the truth, and the life. I, I know him as a way maker, a door opener, a pathfinder. I tell you, I'm so glad for the gift of Jesus the Christ. If, if I don't get anything else but Jesus, I, I've got enough. I can tell you that he'll be joy when you're sad. I'll tell you that he'll be hope in the midst of your despair. I'll tell you that he'll make a way out of no way. That's why one of my favorite songs is my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweeter frame but holy lean on Jesus' name in every high and stormy gale when the wind begins to blow my anchor holds within the veil his oath his covenant and his blood supports me in the whelming flood when folk talk about me his oath his promises are yes and amen if i could sing i would sing i trust in god i know he cares for me a mountain bleak or on the rolling sea my heavenly father watches over me on christ i'm not worried about donald trump on christ i'm not worried about putin on christ i'm not worried about the republicans on christ the solid rock i stand all of the ground is sinking sand. I tell you this, as I take my seat, sometimes he walks with me. Sometimes he talks with me. And every now and then, he lets me know that I am his own. And as I take my seat, 
I like the way John puts it. If any man sin, I read in Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he washed away our sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can cleanse and make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains i like the way the three sisters used to sing it they used to sing all oh, the blood that jesus shed for me way back on calvary it reaches to the highest mountain it flows to the lowest valley and it will never never lose its power and she shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name. Say it for me, choir. Jesus. What are they going to call him? Jesus. Who is he? Is he the lily of the valley? Yes. You say Jesus. Lily of the valley? Jesus. Bright and morning star? Jesus. Hope of glory? Jesus. Alpha and omega? Jesus. Beginning and the ending? First and the last, God all by himself, a will in the middle of the will, he that was and is and is the one to come, we give him praise because he is worthy to be praised. Bless the name of Jesus. Jesus, oh, how sweet the name. Jesus, every day the same. Jesus. Let all saints proclaim his worthy praise forever. I offer you Jesus. It's about to give him some praise. And so, if you want the best gift for Christmas that will cause, cause all other gifts to pale into insignificance, I dare you to grasp a hold of God's unspeakable gift in the person of Jesus. And we just don't know what to do, Karen, just say, Father. I, mean, I know I'm getting older now because these songs mean so much to me. But I just can't figure it out. I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. Thou withdraw thyself from me. Whither shall I go? The door of the church open is the one. Is the one? Two fifty-eight. Thyself from me. I do believe.
before. But I do believe. I now believe that Jesus Now, just as we prepare to sing that last verse for somebody who doesn't know what we're about now, we believe that when God is present in God's house, when God's word has gone forth, opportunity should be extended to you to receive God's unspeakable gift, Jesus the Christ. And so we say the doors of the church are open. And if you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, this is your moment. And I want to say this while I'm talking to my youth leaders and every leader every now and then in your meetings there ought to be a time especially if you have persons that don't belong to the church but even if they do that you extend extend the invitation to discipleship do you know Jesus have you accepted him I do this in the office all the time with my young people do you know him as Lord and Savior the problem is that most of us don't know that God can do what God can do but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. I want to say to my coaches on the basketball court, every now and then, get a little circle. Brothers, have any of y'all, before you can do the hook shot or the three-pointers like Steph Curry, uh, have you ever accepted Jesus? Because he's the reason I think it's Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 that in him all things consist he's the one that holds all things together and so if you have not accepted Jesus this is your moment if you have but you've not made a connection you need to belong to a church you need a home for your soul like you do for your body and if you've just been hanging out today if you hear his voice Heart, not your heart. Come on, choir. Wherever you are, won't you come? This is your moment. Oh, let me receive that gift. My. I do believe. We'll wait for you if there's one. That Jesus. Somebody just give God praise, honor, and glory for what God has done. Khalil, you have such a marvelous voice. 